On July 9, 2012, a CAT 324D track excavator gradually eased its way into the water of the Raritan Inn stretch of the south branch of the Raritan River in Hunterton County, New Jersey. The event marked the end of more than five years of effort by numerous groups and individuals involved in the planning, funding, and permitting needed to begin restoration work on the seven-tenths of a mile stretch. Prior to that morning, to the casual observer, this section of the South Branch looked as it always had, quietly flowing along, its surface as calm as mirrored glass, punctuated only occasionally by small riffles and shallow pools. This normal state, however, is exactly what concerned those who know how the river is really supposed to look and function. The job of all rivers is to erode mountains and carry them to the sea, and if left to their own devices, they do it remarkably well. But human intervention, like damming, channeling, and changing the river's course, impede their ability to do this and almost always result in a cascade of problems. In this particular reach of the South Branch, we had a historic dam built out of stone just above the upper bridge. And that actually changed the stream morphology over the last couple hundred years through this reach. What was happening is the stream started to become more shallow and we lost our thaweg or our deeper part of the channel. And in time it became shallower and shallower and it actually became wider. Then what happens is the river loses its ability to transport sediment in lower flows, sort of like today's lower flows. Any river is gonna you know, be able to transport sediment during a flood situation. The river's raging, it's brown. But today, in this kind of flow, if you have sediment accumulating in your channel, it starts to cover up the insect habitat. Over decades, it covers the riffles, it covers the pools, and, and the boulders that you see now in the channel, they all get buried over time, and the channel just keeps getting wider. We call it a simplified channel. It just lacks good habitat. This is where the restoration work comes in. In simplest terms, it's like giving the river a good hard push to get it back on track and behaving like it should. Then let it do the lion's share of the work. It all started with the delivery of 200 limestone and granite boulders from a local development site. It's important to note these boulders were the only material added to the river during the entire restoration effort, and no material was removed from it. It was only moved around within it. Although once placed in the river, the boulders act as subsurface structure, their primary role is to act as anchors for even larger structures. The most visible of these structures are several U-shaped weirs placed at various locations along the stretch. Building a weir consists of laying out the boulders in an upstream pointing U. This is most often done at the head of an already existing pool or deeper spot in the river's channel. Once the rough layout is complete, individual holes are dug and each boulder is dropped into place. The boulders are then seated with a little muscle from the excavator. Boulder placement is made to look random and natural, with only the very tops of the boulders showing above the water's surface at median flow. With all the boulders that anchor the weir in place, material is excavated to form a pool immediately downstream. Some of the removed material is relocated to just upstream from the weir in order to form a riffle and further anchor the leading edges of the boulders. The rest of the material is moved out to the sides of the river to form point bars. Once a nice deep pool has been excavated, the machine operator begins to tail out the pool. Think of it as forming the shallow end. And then this shallow end tapers into the river's main channel. Six of these riffle, weir, pool, and tail out complexes of varying sizes were formed during the restoration process. Similar, naturally occurring complexes are part of nearly all wild river systems, and the way they function is truly remarkable. After the water flows off the upstream riffle, it dives off the weir down into the deep water of the pool below, scouring it in the process so it doesn't trap sediment. The U-shape of the weir also helps in this regard by creating a helical flow right down the center of the pool and into the channel below thus transporting sediment further downstream. 
You can think of these riffle, weir, pool, and tailout complexes as motors that help to speed up water flow and convey our sediment downstream. They play an extremely important role in restoring a stream to its more natural state. Manipulating the stream channel is yet another way to speed up flow and increase carrying capacity. In many areas, this was simply done by excavating material to deepen the stream channel and then relocating that material to form gravel bars that gently slope from the foot of the bank down to the edge of the channel. The end result is a more well-defined, faster, deeper channel that has less water surface area exposed to the warming effects of the sun, a real bonus for cold water species like trout. Another really good and natural way to make a river flow faster and carry more is to make it travel farther. This can be done by emphasizing the river's natural meanders within its banks. Rather than have a straight channel right down the middle of the river course, coax it into forming its own meanders where the channel flows first along one bank, then gradually moves across the stream bed to flow along the other, and so on. This coaxing is done by creating point bars that alternate sides of the river. Again, all this is done within the banks of the river with materials excavated from the river. On a smaller scale, water can also be made to flow faster by making it flow around something, like say a boulder. By strategically placing boulders at intervals along the river's thalweg, the thalweg being the deepest part of the channel, the flow rate and thus the sediment carrying capacity can be increased. All of this work done to speed flow and help the river move sediment to the sea more efficiently also brings with it a host of biological benefits. As the water dives off the weir, it picks up a considerable amount of dissolved oxygen and delivers it to the depths of the pool. During the summer months and times of low flow, the deeper, cooler, oxygen-rich waters of the pools act as refuges for less heat-tolerant aquatic species. The shallow riffles above the weirs provide excellent habitat for a wide variety of macroinvertebrates during the early stages of their life cycles. They act as mini bug factories that basically crank out the protein needed to support the species further up the food chain. Every effort was made during the restoration process not to damage streamside vegetation as it provides habitat for many insect species and affords much needed cover for nearly everything that swims, including juvenile streambred trout. The roots of the vegetation also help to stabilize the banks and slow erosion. As a bonus, roots extending into the water create a significant amount of subsurface habitat. In some areas, small channels were excavated right up next to banks that already had good cover. Over the past year, more and more trout have been seen taking up residence in these channels, not only for the cover they provide, but for the food they carry. Other bank areas were purposely left completely untouched because they were known to be havens for juvenile trout or had been identified as having spawning reds. We wanted a healthy river. That was the point of our restoration. We weren't trying to make a great fishing hole for, for the anglers necessarily. We were trying to let the river be the river again. And to see uh, the spread of the fish in the population from the large stock trout down to the young of the year, uh, they have hiding places, they have overhead cover, and you know from top to bottom you have much more available habitat for, for all of your, uh, for your trout and for your, your forage base and for your, your macroinvertebrates too. What we're looking for is a biological lift, which means we were at a certain level that may be in a maintenance type of situation and we'd like to get that biology so it becomes more productive and more active. And so by decreasing temperature, increasing flow, providing a, a lot more spawning area and interstitial spaces in the gravel which increase the bug numbers. We're, we're kind of increasing productivity. This river is all connected to its riparian zone and, and that's called connectivity. You want the river system to be connected to its riparian zone and what we're looking for in the future and this is two, three, four years down the line is a total increase in 
pr productivity. So it'll be a biological lift. Biology takes time. So we're talking two or three years down the line before this is gonna be the best kind of thing. And then hopefully stays that way. A full year has now passed since the restoration work on the Raritan Inn stretch was completed. The restored section has seen four full seasons and the conditions each brings. The river looks and sounds great. The trout survived one of the warmest, driest summers on record. The flooding and wind damage from Superstorm Sandy had little effect. The spring and summer insect hatches were the best they've been in years. Emergent vegetation is starting to show on the point bars and sediment seems to be moving through the system rather than accumulating. Getting the project done was no easy task and took a tremendous amount of effort from many people. We did all the permits, five and a half years of permits. We ran against a closed door for a long time, but we kept running, we got it done. You can get it done with time and patience. Collaboration, we use resources of the Watershed Association, experts in stream configuration, advocates for fishing, Trout Unlimited, all good resources. And then we animated it. We brought it all to life over a short period of time that will last for a long time. But we are also measuring. We're looking at sandbar deposition. We're looking at depths of scour pools. We're looking at holding capacity. And if need be, we'll tweak it up. Gather your team, go through the permits, assemble some assets, launch a, a flurry of activity in the water, and then monitor over time. It's easier to do right now given the, the funding mechanisms, et cetera, on private land. But I would love to see it done on county and municipal land uh, because I just think the public, when they see this, is going to really enjoy it. And we could have a river that we can use for the 21st century, as people did in the past. They dammed the river and they channeled the river because that's what they needed at the time. What we need for the 21st century is a natural, free-flowing river, and these restorations do wonderful work, uh, you know, to reach that goal.